Hey guys, I really want to thank you for joining me as we dive into this content on sleep. We're not only going to talk about sleep on performance and hypertrophy, but we're also going to touch on jet lag, caffeine, and alcohol effects on sleep. We're going to talk some data, but also the practical sides of things so that you can implement some of these concepts that we talk about. My name is Raina Sharma, and I'm an FSI for Remote Location Support Western Region, located out of Edmonton. I'm currently finishing up my master's degree in environmental physiology and sport nutrition at the University of Alberta. Um, and my personal athletic background is mostly mountain sport related. So between climbing, mountaineering and backcountry ski touring, it was only a natural that my primary research area has become the impacts of high altitude and caffeine on performance of military personnel. We were actually supposed to do some work at the Nepalese Warfare Training Center back in May, but with the new COVID environment, plans got postponed, so fingers crossed for the new year. Within this presentation, what I'm looking to do is to give you the what as well as the why behind how sleep deprivation is wrecking your gains and what you can do to be more diligent with your readiness in this regard. This will take about 30 minutes of your time. If 30 minutes is a bit steep, you can jump right to the recap slide at the end to take away the main points. I want to start off with a quote, just discussing some of the societal stereotypes that we have regarding sleep. Warren Zabin is actually a musician and songwriter. He's famously quoted as saying, I'll sleep when I'm dead. This idea tends to be a rallying cry among military members, as sleep is thought of as a biological inconvenience rather than a necessity, where it's part of our day that we have to do rather than something that we really look forward to or enjoy because of the health benefits. This leads to the ideology associating sleep deprivation as being normal. We have to be careful about differentiating between common and normal because they are not the same thing. The more people understand why sleep is so important and what it does to the body, the more you see different priorities being reflected in their coaching philosophies. Dr. Ian Duncan works out of the Australian Institute of Sports and he works with soft units in the military and he's often quoted as saying, rest and grind, nah, sleep in and win. Kirk Parsley, former Navy SEAL and also a sleep researcher, works with Navy SEALs returning from different missions. They often have different hormonal issues when they return and sleep issues. So he goes on to say, if you wouldn't get up early to do it, you shouldn't stay up late to do it. If it's important enough, you do either. So get after it. But how many people would wake up an hour early to watch a TV show before they start their day? It's an interesting thought. You may be familiar with micro sleeps where the brain nods off. Um, the brain will intrinsically always get sleep one way or another. It may not be the same quality of sleep, but over time, your brain will fight for its biological need for sleep. Dr. Matthew Walker is a professor, professor of neuroscience and psychology. He became popular and was on a podcast with Joe Rogan recently, but one of his most famous quotes is this one. The number of individuals who can survive on six hours of sleep or less without showing any neurological, physiological, or psychological impairment rounded to a whole number and expressed as a percentage is zero. You'll hear a lot of individuals who claim they feel great on five hours of sleep or they notice nothing wrong after four hours of sleep. And we'll touch on this later about the psychology of self-deception that they put themselves through to convince themselves of that. The CAF rolled out the new balance strategy last year, 2019, which focuses on the important interplay between physical activity, nutrition, adequate sleep, and injury prevention, all of which are required for operational readiness and lifelong wellness. What you'll come to understand is that sleep really is the engine that keeps everything else running optimally. If you have poor sleep, you will have compromised performance, metabolism, and injury risk. The CAF also uses a three-year cycle that rotates throughout the divisions. Each division is engaged in a return to high readiness training once every three years. Three Canadian Div is currently in their high readiness phase with its members deployed on missions and operations around the world. Four Canadian Division is embarked on return to high readiness and two Canadian Division is in the support phase currently. Both pharmacological and behavioral interventions can be effective for improving sleep, but for the purpose of this presentation, we're going to only focus on you at an individual level. This is especially important because certain environmental conditions negatively impact sleep, like altitude, jet lag, heat, cold, improper use of sleep medications, 
um, a lot of the things that we see when you're in your high readiness phase. If your sleep is compromised with the garrison, it's a safe bet that you will only decline in the field. I'm sure everyone has seen the sleep duration recommendations from the National Sleep Foundation. So I've clipped out a little piece here. Adults fall under the seven to nine hour category. You'll see some individuals who are at the higher end of the range at 10 hours and some at the lower end at the six hours, which is a very, very slim portion of the population. So if you're looking at this and thinking, oh, that's me, it's probably not. There is a certain genetic SNP, which is a segment of genetic code that's present in less than 1% of the population, which allows them to have higher levels of wakefulness and survive on less because, or less than the normal amount of sleep. A lot of people think that that's them because they subsist on six hours of sleep or less. And that just means that you're used to being sleep deprived all the time. You could be better. Yeah, you might have a day or two where you get less than five to six hours of sleep, and you were fine, but the point being is to not do that all the time. You can get by with a couple days of suboptimal sleep conditions and it won't have any tangible effect, but the problem is when you start living the chronic lifestyle of being underslept, it'll really start to rack up. If you're demanding a lot from your body physically, your recovery time courses will be larger and demand more from a recovery standpoint. More advanced athletes, therefore, need more advanced strategies to help that fatigue dissipate. Now, if we look at sleep science, what actually governs your sleep? We will be able to understand the why behind the what. There are really two main factors that are going to cause you to sleep. So one, you have your central sleep drive, and two, you have your circadian rhythm, which function on a 24-hour spectrum, and they will occur without any sort of light. So if you put someone in a pitch black room, their circadian rhythm continues to function they'll get tired at roughly the same time, and then they'll feel awake at roughly the same time. So it's very, very interesting. Going back to point number one though, this innate sleep drive, this is driven by how active you are throughout the course of the day. So basically, the more active you are throughout the day, the more you will break down a specific molecule in the body called ATP, which is a neuromodulator of sleep. Um, as ATP goes up, you'll, as ATP breakdown goes up, you'll find your, yourself getting more and more tired. A Zeitgeber, on the other hand, down below here, is the German word for essentially anything that is a time giver or synchronizer. So these are factors in your environment. They are going to help regulate your circadian rhythm. The three main drivers here are food, temperature, and light. If you think about this logically, at the end of the day, you see temperature drop as the sun sets, light is reduced in wavelength, but also intensity, and food consumption usually tends to drop off as certain satiety signals change and certain hormones within the body are upregulated. These hormones function on a diurnal basis, meaning that they fluctuate throughout the day. They are not static every day, all day. For an example, testosterone is not the same all day, every day. Now, if we think about sleep, we think about a recommendation of seven to nine hours. A full sleep cycle lasts about 90 minutes. So if you calculate this out to end your sleep cycle at the end your sleep at the end of a sleep cycle, this would be seven and a half to nine hours. Delving a little deeper, sleep typically occurs in five stages. You don't want to think about it of how, many, how much REM sleep can I get? You wanna think of it as how many cycles of sleep can you get through a night? You'll also notice at this graph that the length of time spent in REM, that's the blacked out zone, um, increases the longer you sleep. So that's really critical. The duration of REM sleep that you get occurs later in sleep. Diurnal variations. For the purpose of simplification for this series, the two main hormones we're going to talk about are melatonin and cortisol. These two hormones are inversely related, meaning when melatonin is high, cortisol is low and vice versa. These two hormones push your circadian rhythm one way or another. So when cortisol is high, you feel awake and alert, generally speaking, and when melatonin is high, you start to feel sleepy. It's your onset of sleep. If you look at this chart on the right, you'll see that when melatonin starts to kick in at about 9 or 10 p.m., 
for most folks, they start to feel the onsets of sleep. As the night goes on, melatonin starts to drop off. And then down here, this large spike in cortisol that you see typically occurs when the sun is rising. So this isn't always the case as circadian rhythms can be shifted, but light is gonna be one of your strongest drivers of that cortisol spike in the morning, which is why things like blue light blockers, UV light desk stands, and those light clocks have been getting so popular. We'll get back to this later, but that's generally how your circadian rhythms are regulated by those two hormones from a very simplistic point of view. 90% of your body serotonin is actually produced by your enterochromaffin cells in the GI tract, which eventually gets converted into melatonin. So you can see this little pathway here. This is why it's important to get protein in for breakfast because a lot of you are probably already doing this if you're interested in performance and hypertrophy, um, but it is important to start your sleep hygiene first thing upon waking, so with a high protein breakfast. So how does sleep play into hypertrophy? There's probably an encyclopedia's worth of training nutrition articles churned out every day, but sleep seems so esoteric to people. How it tangibly affects training goals is somewhat of a black box for most people. However, not only does sleep deprivation keep you pudgy, it also makes it much more difficult to build those muscles and recover from training. Right off the bat, if you sleep deprive someone for four hours, it decreases glucose metabolism by 30 to 40%. How does this play into hypertrophy? Well, we know that glycogen, which is stored glucose, is going to be one of your main drivers for how well you can handle volume and your total cumulative load. So the more carbs that you can put through a system, the more volume you can typically handle, and the more muscles you can sub subsequently recruit and grow. Looking further, it also affects insulin sensitivity, so how easily we can get the carbs out of the blood and into the muscle. Sleep deprivation increases insulin resistance where carbs can't get out of the blood as easily and into the muscle. And we see that in individuals sleeping less than five hours, that they have a 20% reduction in a single night of sleep. So it's a pretty significant difference. Looking forward at the anti-anabolic effects of sleep deprivation. Growth hormone is one of your biggest pulsatile hormones during sleep. So most of it occurs during slow wave sleep, which is your REM sleep. If you look at the research, there's a direct link between sleep span, so how much someone sleeps over the span of their life, and also the variation in testosterone secretion over an individual's day. Testosterone directly increases muscle hypertrophy. It inhibits other activity of proteins that block the mTOR pathway, which is pretty much just your primary cellular pathway of muscular hypertrophy. And the effects of testosterone levels within this physiological range on muscle hypertrophy can be overstated. So injecting steroids makes a noticeable difference, but swings within the normal healthy range aren't massively important. And testosterone levels don't paint the whole picture of someone's ability to gain muscle in response to training, but there's no denying that's an important piece of the puzzle. And then we have IGF-1, um, which is also an important aspect of muscular hypertrophy, working through that same mTOR pathway. So pretty much the moral of the story here is that with sleep deprivation, you have a reduction in protein synthesis via two separate pathways, but it just keeps getting worse. It also has catabolic effects of sleep deprivation. Um, so this just means acute elevations of cortisol while training, we talked about cortisol in the previous two slides, um, are totally normal and expected, but when you don't sleep enough, your vagal tone gets skewed. So this pushes more to the symp sympathetic, that fight or flight response, or adrenaline-based, which pushes cortisol high, and you can imagine how this impacts the person's sleep or ability to fall asleep when cortisol actually should be low towards the end of the day. This is a very simplistic explanation. There's obviously a lot of other things happening, but for what we care about right now, I just wanted to touch on that so we have a good foundation moving forward. So what are the actual decrements in physical performance that you would be able to see? So first, there's a decreased time to exhaustion in sleep-deprived individuals, meaning that you get tired faster on a higher rep sets. Secondly, there is Bench press, one rep max drops by 20 pounds after just a four hour sleep restriction. That's a single four hour sleep restriction. Third, increased subjective RPE, meaning that things are feeling more difficult. Four, 
increased cardiovascular and thermal regulatory strain and reduced vagal tone, meaning that you can't relax as easily. And then five, some data suggests that almost a twofold increase of injury incidence in sleep deprived individuals. So more importantly, if you're that person that's constantly struggling with nagging chronic injuries, ligamentous injuries, joint issues, tendonitis, there's a much higher injury incidence in those who are sleep deprived. There's a famous study that I just want to highlight here. So what they did was they took a group of individuals and let them sleep eight and a half hours a night. And then they took another group and let them sleep five and a half hours. Both groups lost a decent amount of weight. So one group lost 2.9 versus the three kilos of the other group. So almost the same amount of weight. However, the proportion of fat free mass, so muscle mass versus fat mass out of that weight loss was drastically different between groups. The sleep deprived group lost 55% less fat and 60% more muscle out of the three kilos that they lost. So it's a pretty significant difference in the sleep deprived group had worse body or body composition despite losing the same amount of weight. So this is really important if you're only watching the, the scale changes, um, maybe take a look at the mirror and look at some subjective markers as well. And just bringing us back to the balance strategy. So now that we have a good foundation, it's worth keeping in mind that poor sleep is both a, both a cause and a symptom of overtraining. If you're finding yourself feeling worn down and have issues sleeping in spite of feeling exhausted, like that inability to fall asleep, waking up a lot throughout the night, it might be wise to dial back your training and increase your caloric intake for a couple weeks um, to see if your sleep issues are being caused by excessive accumulated training stress. Or better yet, if you're on a good program and you can auto-regulate within the program itself, if you have a really bad sleep and you're not too sure about how the next training session is going to go, push it back a day or take a light training session and you can get back to training the next day. The intensity of your training sessions is really what's going to drive your gains and performance in the gym, um, making you stronger and more powerful as performance athletes. So you need to be able to hit a threshold of intensity to perform in the field and for that overload to be met. You can certainly be under recovered without experience, experiencing soreness. So that's that delayed onset muscle soreness. Does that mean that there's a lack of soreness, meaning lack of trauma or recovery needs? No, it doesn't necessarily mean that. You still have inflicted damage on the connective tissue and on the innervating nervous tissue components, and those still have a recovery time course that um, sleep really benefits. Other factors to consider. So transmeridian travel, this would be your jet lag. The United States uh, Armed Forces is the world leader with regards to the field of sleep deprivation. Obviously the size and budget of the US forces allow it to conduct extensive research. And fortunately for the US allied forces, the US has been sharing a lot of the results for most of their studies. Um, one of which that I would like to point out here that I've taken the slides for, is the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. So they have one of the best documents on sleep deprivation management used by the US Army. They provide a really detailed table on basic sleep scheduling factors and the need to obtain critical amounts of sleep. They talk about sleep periods, duration of sleep periods, napping, and prioritizing sleep need by task and individual differences. This section here divides sleep management records um, according to the five deployment phases. So you have your pre-deployment, deployment, pre-combat, deployment, pre combat, combat, and post-combat combat phase, giving detailed explanation on some aspects of sleep management during each phase, which is super helpful. There's also this idea of sleep banking. Two weeks prior to a trip or period where you know your sleep is gonna be compromised, you're gonna try to front load your sleep. So there's a lot of sleep scientists that say that you need to go to bed and wake up at exactly the same time every day. And while consistency is important, so we don't want to discount that when you're able to, um, a sleep banking approach is a really important strategy when you're looking at approaching a field exercise or deployment or even a travel or shift work, like an overnight shift. Um, sleep banking has been really effective for showing improvements in performance during sleep deprivation periods and helping you perform better. This is a whole other interesting conversation between the debate of sleep debt and sleep banking. So if you're interested in more of this, definitely free, feel free to reach out, but we won't go down that rabbit hole during this presentation. 
Another factor to consider would be alcohol. Alcohol is one of the most misunderstood sleep aids out there. In fact, it's not a sleep aid at all. It can be problematic for your sleep. First, alcohol is in a class of drugs called sedatives. Sedation is not sleep. Sedation, you're switching off the firing of your brain cells, and that's not a natural sleep. That's not what happens. The second problem with your alcohol is it can fragment your sleep by triggering and activating that fight or flight response of the nervous system, which will wake you up more frequently throughout the night. Not only that, thirdly, it can also block your REM sleep, that fifth stage of really crucial sleep that we need. A third factor to consider would be caffeine intake. Caffeine, while near and dear to my heart, it has many caveats to use in its fine print. And there are two hidden features of caffeine one of which is the duration of action of caffeine. So caffeine has an approximate half-life of five to six hours. What that means is that after five to six hours, 50% of the caffeine that you had is still circulating in your system. In other words, if you had a cup of coffee at 2 p.m., it could be that almost a quarter of that caffeine is still swirling around in your brain at midnight. That's the first feature of caffeine. The second issue with caffeine is that it can change the quality of your sleep. A lot of people will say that caffeine doesn't affect me. I can drink it right before bed and still fall asleep. Even if that is true, it turns out that caffeine can actually decrease the amount of stages three to four of non-REM sleep, so non-rapid eye movement sleep, that restorative sleep phase that you need. So as a consequence, even though you might not notice it, you won't sleep as deeply and you won't feel as restored when you wake up. As a result, you get caught in this weird cycle of you have trouble falling asleep, you take a sleep aid, trouble maintaining vigilance the next day, so you turn to coffee, have a cup of coffee late in the day after work when you're feeling a little tired, and then that keeps you up, you have trouble falling asleep, and you're caught in this vicious cycle. This is especially interesting when pre-workouts have gotten so popular, with ergogenic doses of caffeine being three to nine milligrams per kilogram of body weight. So I would say have a cutoff time for yourself for your coffee intake or your caffeine intake being noon or even earlier around 10 a.m., which is fine because usually more, like morning PT occurs at around like 7.30. On that line, maybe save the ergogenic doses of caffeine for the times that you really need it in the field rather than getting caught in this cycle during your regular day-to-day -day lives when you could be prioritizing general sleep health, especially now that we're in this different pace um, due to COVID. If you don't sleep or you shortcut your sleep in order to train more or you're using caffeine to offset the sleep deprivation, you're probably gonna cause more chronic issues than you realize. And if you really rely on sleep aids, ask yourself why. Think biochemically. What is going on that an individual needs a sleep aid to go to sleep at night? If someone isn't aware of the data surrounding hypnotics or sleeping pills and issues surrounding the cancer rates and mortality associated with them, I would strongly encourage you to at least dig up a little bit of the literature that's out there because it's not that great. And people need to be aware of this before they take a pharmaceutical sleeping agent um, when we could be targeting some behavioral interventions when we can. So what about all these different gadgets to monitor sleep? Well, what about the fact that we've completely lost the ability to be intuitive about sleep? So Apple Watches and Aura Rings and Garmin, there's so many different devices out on the market. Is the device that you're using actually testing what it's supposed to be testing? So looking into the validity and the reliability of the device that you're putting a lot of stock into. So for an example, Garmin's aren't actually that good for monitoring your sleep. If you use a smartwatch, they're really good for mountain sports and activity counts, but I wouldn't put too, too much stock into the sleep features. The tech can also cause some people to be overly anxious about the data. Um, it's over tracking, you get a lot of data, it's telling you you're getting a bad sleep and so therefore you do get a bad sleep. Um, the question I have to ask for you is, do you really need a watch to tell you how well you slept? If you can't be intuitive about sleep, then there's other things that we need to look at um, before moving on to um, tracking that nitty gritty. One thing I would recommend to do is to figure out what your baseline actually is. So there are several quick questionnaires that you can do yourself that will give you a score. There is the athlete sleep screening questionnaire, which is more of a way to identify clinically significant sleep problems. 
if you do this one pre-season and then again post-season, it's more of a long-term screening questionnaire. The one I've listed is the Athlete Sleep Behavior Questionnaire as well, which is meant to be used more frequently. So I put that ASBQ and ASSQ. You have your sleep health index. And then in my research, I use the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index, which takes about five minutes to complete and you get general sleep education and individualized sleep recommendations as well. And then you can retest this at 30, 60 and 90 days to track changes or improvements in your sleep. Again, all of these sleep hygiene points are summative. The more of these you can do a night or a day, the better you will be set up for your sleep during the night. Good hygiene really does start in the morning, not just the hour before bed. And like anything else, the more consistent you can be, the better you will feel. It's like exercise, it's like nutrition. You really just have to set yourself a schedule and build up some habits for yourself. Um, you have to say, there's no kidding around with this. It's not flexible. And then once you get good at it, you can be more intuitive about it. You're not human, you're not mortal. Nothing will break you faster than not sleeping and nothing will improve your performance faster than sleeping well. I've attached some great resources here. I've already talked about the awesome work the US is doing. The Naval Medical R&D has done a guide that includes six different techniques to help you overcome sleep deprivation during field training, which is really handy. They have a work rest sleep plan. They have a recognition of sleep degradation, individual tolerances to sleep loss, and self-control to sleep when the individual needs it, and discussions on AIDS. The Australian Army is often used in comparison with the Canadian Army, just due to its similarity in terms of size, resources, and budget. And they also published a really interesting and complete guide on sleep deprivation with recommendations titled Fatigue Management During Operations, a Commander's Guide. And of course, you have all of your local PSP for support. Jeff Nichols, who is a former Navy SEAL, he is also a strength and conditioning coach now. He subsequently retired from the military and he goes on to say, your ability to function on little to no sleep is more so a testament to your body's resilience and not its performance capacity. I'll leave you with one final thought. Education is not something that you can finish. While this presentation has a lot of details, the literature is constantly changing and continues to grow and change over the years. So let this be an introduction to sleep, how it relates to hypertrophy and training in the field. References are on the next few slides if you want to check any of it out. Thanks for sticking through this presentation. Keep training hard, keep sleeping.